evidence, and we'll uh, try to answer them as best we can. So undoubtedly some of you may have thought of some questions you've had overnight, uh, for those of you who were here yesterday. And we're happy to answer any questions about our life as well as uh, any other questions, if we can. So, so feel free to ask whatever you want. Now, we're probably going to sit down or remain seated for a little of this so that we can relax. So those of us who, of you who can't see us, you might want to move to a seat where you can see it, <laughs> or move your seat around a little. And I know the sun's the attractive thing over there. But uh, I won't be able to see your hands. So when we're done, we're done. Who would like to go first? <laughs> We're all shy. We're all gun shy. Uh, I've got a question. Fire away. Related to yesterday's work, right? can you explain the process and cause of multiple personality disorder? Sure. Um, multiple personality disorder is actually multiple spirit connections with a person. And uh, so what often happens is a person who has some uh, some emotional issues within themselves of not wanting to stay present with themselves. Often what happens is they attract a group of spirits, particularly if they're highly mediumistic, they attract a group of spirits who um, want to work through their emotional issues through the person. And what happens is uh, this often happens due to therapies that uh, may be uh, available to the person as well. And the person can have up to 40 or 50 or even more people uh, attracted to them from the spirit world uh, because they uh, want to work through their issues through the person. So let's say Mary was highly mediumistic and, and, but also had some issues that she wanted to deny in her personal life. Often what will happen is a lot of other spirits will attach to her and want to work through their issues because she's a medium. and. Uh, and, but she's not conscious of that mediumship or she doesn't want to develop that mediumship. So she will actually hear them, uh, they will actually uh, put her, it, she will often be in a trance uh, type of state when, when one of these other alter personalities enter her, if you like. <coughs> so, and I'm not, to, there, there is, uh, there are some forms of what you would classify as multiple personality. Uh, which are much less intense than that, which are a part of our own personality. So in other words, we have multiple instances in our lives where we have emotions locked up at a certain childhood, particularly if we've experienced traumatic events. And so at, at the time of the trauma, our personality, our emotion is locked up at that time. So I'm not talking about those kind of, uh, what, we, what they classify as multiple personality, because that, that kind of uh, multiple personality the person is totally conscious of, generally, and or can be made totally conscious of. I'm talking about the type of multiple, multiple personality which is referred to where the person seems to not be con the, the, all these so-called alter personalities don't have an idea of the other ones that are existing, or only have an idea of a subset of the other ones that exist connected to the person, and they are all spirits. And I've actually lived with a person uh, who had multiple personality for nearly seven years. And this lady had uh, um, around 32 spirits attached to her in this way. And quite often I was talking, to, not talking to her at all, but talking to one of these other spirits. And, and at the time I had no idea. I believed totally that they were just multiple fractions of herself. But uh, as I, as I, uh, as I uh, talked to different ones, I started realising that they actually had lives, uh, which you would call probably past lives, but they're actually of hers, but in reality they're not past lives of hers. I started identifying them as each one having a unique personality, each one had a unique life on earth, and they were all attracted to this lady because of her emotional injuries. So because, sorry, so because of the fact that um, they had different personalities, and you know that the that the essence um, is 
eternal. Uh, it couldn't have been her, is it? Exactly. That, well, I know, I know they weren't her. I, I've, I've spoken to some of these spirits since, and uh, some of them have progressed on the divine path since, and some of them have not progressed at all, and some of them are still around this lady. Um, and so I've, yeah, I've talked to her, uh, to talk to these spirits who are around her. So, you know, I know them now to be spirits. At the time when it was occurring, I didn't understand that, and I just felt. Um, while I was helping her, I just felt that it was some kind of uh, multiple personality, like most people assume. But, but if I had known that they were spirits, I would have helped them a lot easier um, than, I, than it took to help them when I was speaking with them. They, they, uh, they ranged in age uh, from 90 down to three years of age. Uh, and so uh, the whole multiple personality idea would not support a 90-year-old multiple uh, alter. They would all be child alters. Uh, but this uh, lady, one, this this girl, once I talked with her and had many opportunities to talk with her over that period of time, um, I talked to different alter, so-called alters, but many of them were older than she is, and that's what made me start suspecting that actually they weren't alter personalities, but rather that she was a medium, mm. and these were just spirits connecting with her. And so um, now when I can see it, I can see that some of them were actually people that she knew when she was alive who passed and were connected with her as well and were relating some of her, her their experiences. The 90-year-old lady, for example, was a lady who knew her and who had passed and, and I recognised that after some time. But um, in all of these cases that I've met, um, the, the multiple personalities are actually multiple spirit connections through a very mediumistic person who wants to refuse their own gift of mediumship generally. So in other words, they, they find it very difficult to accept that they're a medium. And also they have another option and that is they want to get away from their own life. So uh, one of the ladies that I've met who had the same uh, problems had a deep desire to get away from any traumatic experience while it was happening. And so the instant a traumatic experience would occur in her life, the instant one of these altars, so-called altars, would appear, which is just a spirit. All she did was she stepped back from her own body and one of the spirits just took over her body in that particular instance. So it might be a spirit who could handle anger. So that spirit would step in and just get in a rage back. You know, it might be a spirit who could handle fear. So that spirit stepped in and she went into a state of silence and just went into rigid rigidity. Uh, it might be a spirit, spirit who could handle sexual activity. So when she was presented with se sexual projections from somebody, this spirit would step in and deal with those projections. And so uh, the, these spirits would step in under different circumstances and they'd step in because this lady had a desire to get away from her own self in these interactions. And she had such a strong desire to do that that these spirits would naturally step in. She would just go out of body and they would step in her body instantly. And interact. So it's your alter egos, like Superman. Yeah, but they're not. E See, I would classify the ego as what's going on within yourself. These are these are actual spirit entities. So these are people who have lived on Earth before, connecting to this woman, and and she is disconnecting from herself and allowing them to operate through her. And the reason why she disconnects from herself is because. She doesn't want to cope with that particular circumstance or, or cope with that particular problem that's going on at the time. So, for instance, if she was having an argument with her mother, she, she would step out of the issue and another spirit would come in and argue with her mother. And how do you help people like that? The first thing you need to do is to help them come to accept their own life and help them come to tune into their own uh, emotions at every single occasion. The reason why these alter so-called personalities come, or these spirits come, is because the person doesn't want to deal with their emotions in that particular interaction. So let's say, for instance, let's say the lady was receiving some sexual projections from a male. Because she couldn't cope with that because of some of her childhood experiences, what she would do would she'd step out of her body and, and there was a male spirit who hated men being abusive and, and, and sexually abusive who would step in to her body and she'd become like this male, you know, dealing with these men who were projecting sexually at her. 
Now, she, it's not her that's doing that, it's the spirit doing that for her. Now, the, way, the only way that she could actually work through that issue is to stop wanting to get out of her body and actually feel the emotions that, that the, the law of attraction has brought to her in order to deal with this emotion from her childhood of being abused by men. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. so the key is to help them get to the stage where they want to take responsibility for all of their own emotions rather than stepping away from these situations and then having someone else take responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Dave, can I just ask, where would that leave her on the spirit planes when she passes over because she hasn't recognised her own? Um, she will most probably arrive in the first sphere. And the reason why is that any person generally who is detuning from their own emotions uh, generally arrives in the first sphere. Um, so, because, it, because in the process of detuning from your own emotions, you can't process your own emotions, and it's the processing of your own emotions or the release of your own emotions that causes you to grow in natural love or divine, or divine love, depending on whether you're connecting to God or not. Yeah. So the presence of spirits wouldn't necessarily affect where she goes Thank after you. she Thank passes. You. Yeah, It's just like any of us, if we're in avoidance of an emotion, we might do it in a lot of different ways. That's her way, or because she's so mediumistic, that's how it happens. But yeah, mm. it, that wouldn't have an impact directly. So many others would choose a different way. So some mm. people, instead of avoiding their emotions by stepping out of their body, will avoid their emotions by going and having a drink. Does that make sense? Like it's almost the same thing. One, one way is you step out of your body, someone else steps in to handle the thing. The other one is I don't handle it at all and I just go and have a drink. Uh, and that's why some of us use drugs, some of us use drink, some of us use work, some of us use sex, some of us use out-of-body experiences and so forth. Yeah. AJ, when somebody's killed in a, an accident, um, they can be saying that they've got some fairly heavy emotions that they've repressed? Perhaps? Not necessarily. Um, you know how most of you have had an accident last week where you've cut yourself or just nicked yourself or something like that. You know, you might be cooking dinner and just nick yourself with a knife or using the scissors and just cut yourself and those kind of things. Well, they're little, they're little indicators of how you feel about yourself. Every, every time you harm yourself like that, even though we call it an accident, it's actually the soul attraction based on what's going on inside the soul. So the soul is actually feeling bad about itself at that particular time and, and it's a self-punishing type of emotion. So a person who attracts an accident which, from which they die have fairly large self-punishing emotions to deal with. Now that doesn't mean that they are in really, really bad condition because they may have really lots of good feelings towards other people, lots of love in their heart towards people, and all these other things. If they're a child, it will actually be the parent's self-punishing emotions that may attract that event for the child. So every circumstance is very different, and it's very important not to judge the individual, you know, in terms of the circumstance and then say this applies all the time, because it's all very dependent upon personality, background, situation with family and parents and all the other people around you as well as what's going on for the person themselves. Because that's what the Law of Attraction is all about. Every single person involved in the event actually had a Law of Attraction for the event. And they would just go on to deal with that in the spirit world? Yeah, well normally what would happen is they would arrive in the spirit world and, and uh, one of the things that they'll be working through emotionally is this, uh, the reason why they died. For many of them, uh, the reason, like for many, if they're younger persons who have died, uh, many times, let's say they've been a car accident and they're a younger person who's died, many times it's ha it has been because of the recklessness of themselves or someone else. And, and these are all driven by emotions within themselves. And so the spirits helping them would actually help them come to terms with those emotions. And uh, whether they want to or not it will depend on how well they progress. So if they really badly want to deal with those emotions, they'll progress very rapidly. If they want to avoid those emotions and they feel very attracted to the sadness of the people they've left behind or they feel very attracted to the fact that they've now lost their life and they're really enjoying their life, then they might not progress as rapidly. Yeah. It just depends. Remember that just like you have choices right now, they have choices. So every, even when you pass, you've got all these choices that you make. And uh, the choice... The, 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 
making decisions does not change just because you're fast. Do you want to say why you asked that question? Um, I don't really know why. You know, I guess I have a, had a cousin who was killed in a motorbike accident a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I guess I've always wondered How old? why that happened. He was probably 19 or 20 at the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, he actually prompted your question. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so and he's wondering why... He's wondering, he's wondering a number of things. He's wondering firstly why his life was cut short. He was really quite enjoying his life. Yeah. He felt that life on earth was pretty good and he was enjoying himself. He can see though that you know, he was perhaps reckless at, at times uh, with his life. And he had, a, he had the feeling inside of himself that he could never die. It was a, it's common for young men in particular to have this feeling that uh, they're invincible. And he certainly had that feeling within him, that he was invincible and it didn't really matter what he did. When his time was up, his time was up sort of thing. And now he realises that that's a mistake. But he's also not uh, progressed too much from that point of time um, because he, 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 hasn't, he was very much drawn back to earth because of the sadness of the family, in families, I should say. Um, so he spent a lot of his time trying to cheer everybody up and, and also he had this terrible feeling inside of himself of having lost his life and lost all these lovely opportunities and felt he's also felt some rage at that as well, which he's now work, worked through. But now he's in this state of wanting to know how to get from where he is onwards. So what I'd like to do is tell him how. Um, and that is by, if he just asks one of the bright, there's a bright, some bright spirits that are on the divine love path near him, all he needs to do is ask for their presence and they, he will see them. And then once he does that, if he listens very carefully to what they suggest to him, he will be able to progress very, very rapidly from where he is now. He's in the top of the first sphere, Summerland type place, uh, so he's in a quite a good space, so he'll be able to progress very rapidly. But he's been wondering for some time how to progress. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Any others? When you chose to come back here, did you know that you wouldn't remember things straight away? Yes. Yeah. The process of remembering is the, is the process of allowing the emotions that lock up the memory. So any of you that have experienced childhood trauma, many of you here actually don't remember your childhoods very well. <coughs> Have you noticed that? Like quite a number of you. Who, who doesn't remember their childhoods very well? Right? So there's quite a number, yeah. I could feel that from you. And, and the reason why is that we can only remember if we allow the emotion. So, so this is the problem that we've, or the conundrum that we face, you could say. A lot of times we know that there's been some traumatic events in our childhood that we don't want to allow the emotion of. But the problem of not allowing the emotion turns off the memory. And so what, what we knew before we returned was that we would have to go through this process of allowing emotion before we would remember. So in my case what happened was as soon as I started allowing emotion, I, mem the memory of events started hitting me. Now that began before I realised who I was, it just, just started happening th uh, about 12 years ago. And I started having these emotions of being tortured and abused. Um, which I had to work my way through. And, and that took me seven years uh, of, of my processing to actually work through these emotions. So I, I couldn't understand where they were from because I had this feeling that they didn't happen in this life, but I had no feeling that there was no other life. And so I just allowed myself to assume that it must have happened in this life and I'd just turned it off somehow. And all I did was allow the experience of the emotions to flow. Now, when I began to allow the experience of the emotions to flow, then the memories started appearing more, with more clarity. And as they started appearing more clarity, I went through a process of remembering the circumstances in which these events happened. And, uh, and then, of course, associated with that was, was who I am and all these other things as well. Now, Mary's faced a very similar process very recently, so, so you might be able to explain it a little bit. Thank <laughs> you.
What part, of no, what part of no didn't you understand? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the word no is. <laughs> um, yeah, similar thing. Um, I have found that when I've allowed my emotions, when I started my emotional processing, a lot of things have come up that I didn't understand. And um, a lot of men, but I, for a long time that scared me quite a bit and I shut down a lot of my emotions um, because uh, AJ knew who he was at that time and felt who I was, but I was very resistant about that being a reality for me. Uh, so I began emotionally processing because I loved the, what he was teaching and I found a lot of things came up that were quite, that I remember my childhood quite well and it didn't fit with my childhood. Um, and it seemed to relate to him as well and it wasn't until um, I sort of just allowed the emotions to be there that I've had more clarity about what they're actually about. It's quite a disconcerting sort of a feeling process. Um, it requires letting go of the intellect quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, it, a lot of things that I feel don't make sense to me and I just have to trust um, that they're going to lead me to some clarity at the end of it. Um, yeah. Um, oh yeah. I um, I recently um, had a lot of feelings about um, uh, having a child. I haven't had a child in this life, and um, I began to have. I've had strong feelings about having children a lot and um, the law of attraction brought a series of different events um, which triggered me a lot about children, um, the value of children, like I was facing um, situations where people weren't valuing their children and I was becoming very upset about it um, and a couple of other things happened that really triggered me emotionally. One was a movie and it was about the death of a child and I just... Um, I had quite a disproportionate sort of a reaction to it. And so I, um, I just allowed myself to go with that feeling, like I, I allowed myself to really touch into the grief that I was feeling. And from that I connected with the memory of having had a child that died. Um, yeah. So that, that was really intense. You're not going to get much out of it about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I still find it hard to be quite open about these things because it, um, I still feel a lot of judgement about what, um, what it is we're going through and um, I feel quite vulnerable about that. Yeah. It's hard for me to understand, so sometimes I, like, I can recognise why it's hard for others to understand <laughs> what it's about. Um, yeah, so... Feel a little reticent at times. You'll have to excuse me. Yeah. But Mary, it's very interesting because when I asked AJ the question before, you answered actually what I asked. Uh -huh. Because yeah. coming from a woman, I realised that you'd, you'd seen the woman, what I hadn't actually asked, but you understood what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sometimes that happens. Yes. Yeah. So it's very valuable. Mm, thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So getting back to the question, um, every single person here has memories in, locked inside of them that they can't remember. And the reason why they can't remember them is because they've not allowed the emotion of that to come present and actually experience the emotion. So the process that we're going through is exactly the same process that every person here needs to go through and that is allow all of your emotions and don't question it intellectually. Just allow these emotions to become present and flow through you. When you do, you will actually regain any memory that you've lost. And on top of that, you will no longer have an emotional signature to those memories. So I've had to go through lots of processes, of course, where I've remembered lots of events from my life from the, for the last... In 2,000 years, you fit a lot into your life. So, I've had lots and lots of events and memories of all of those events through in the first century and also in the spirit world. And then I've had lots of emotions that I've had to release before I could have those memories. Once I release those emotions, then those memories come 
and the memories now don't have any emotional signature anymore. The purpose of doing it this way is to actually teach people what they need to do. Mm -hmm. To show to show that that's how you can release emotion. So we, we feel that it one of the primary reasons why we came and did it this way was to show you how to actually process your emotions and work towards God from a, in a practical way. Because if, if we just came and it, we, we had a lot of options of coming <coughs> and a lot of way, uh, ways that we would, could have come to earth. Uh, but if we chose any of the other ways, then every single person would have viewed us totally differently than they view themselves. They would have viewed us as these you know, high beings who have all of this power and all of this stuff going on and, and have no problems and, and in the end it would have made us seem like aliens to you. That's what the church tried to do originally, wasn't it, to sort of separate you guys from um, the mass of people exactly. and, and therefore for their own purposes, you know, yeah. acting as intermediaries. And then, yeah, well, this is why with myself they, you know, turned me into being the son of God and then they turned me into being a part of God. And while I am a part of God in a sense that I've received divine love from God, that's the only way that I'm a part of God. Just And when you receive divine love, you will be a part of God in the same way. But the, the uh, problem is that the church then turned that into being some kind of unique being, being God, in fact. And that's why you know it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost for most Christian religions. And the problem with that is that it's turned me into being from from being a man into being God that nobody else can ever achieve at the same kind of things that that I achieve from an emotional perspective. And and this is something that I greatly wanted to undo. So one of my biggest emotions within me is a desire to undo that. And, and actually help everyone see that I am just the same as you, I am just the same as every single person here, Mary is just the same as any woman here, and if you follow this path, you will gain a one with God, and you will be totally different from other people's perspective to what you were when you began. Um, but that doesn't change that this, this goal or this potential is available to every one of you. But the way it's available is by working through your emotions. The way it's available is by allowing all of the emotions to flow through you. That's one of the ways, because there are many other things that you need to also realise in this process, but it's one of the primary things you need to do first, is to allow the emotions to flow. So if a person says that they don't feel any negative feelings from childhood, for example, does that mean they're denying emotions? Yes. <laughs> That's a definite yes, it's not just a probably yes. Unless the person is at one with God, okay. uh, the person certainly has emotions from their childhood. Because the problem is that every single person on this planet ha ha has been put through the same process. It's not a problematic process because God created it, it's a problematic process because people on earth have denied their emotions multi-generationally. Mm -hmm. So every piece of emotion that you've stored inside of yourself gets passed down to your child. Mm -hmm. And so the child now also has this emotion within them. And each emotion that's in you at the snapshot of time that you conceived your child is now also entering them. And so the problem is, is that we all passing down emotions from parents to child and so forth multi-generationally. And this is within every single person on earth. The only way to release it completely is to progress towards either towards the natural love pinnacle, which is the sixth fear, or towards the divine love path, which is infinite in progression, and become at one with God. But the only way to do it in both cases is to release emotions. And so we often deny our emotions. We're very good on earth, at, on earth on, about, on denying emotion, not very good at, at accepting that we actually have them. Um, so how can how can one start accepting that they have them, or how can someone help another person to start accepting that they have them? Well, it's, it's very hard to help another person accept yeah. they have them. Let's look firstly, though. There is a there are ways to help, of, of course, um, 
the way God uh, created for all of us to actually connect with emotion is truth. So, so the first thing we need to do is start seeing truth in our own life. Remember, I said in the first century that truth will set you free. So it's only the truth that frees you from the emotional baggage that, we, that each of us have. But I'm not talking about my personal truth. I'm talking about God's truth will set you free. Now, what, how God sees you is totally different to how you see you. Because God knows every single thing inside of you that's in disharmony with truth and in disharmony with love. So the first step, I feel, is to start praying to God about all the things that are in disharmony with truth within you, that you're denying within yourself. But obviously for that to begin, you need to have a desire to do that. So that's where every single person on the planet will need to develop a personal desire to actually connect to God if they want to do that. Yeah. Now they don't have to, no. but they'll have to if they want to be at one with God at some point in the future. They'll have to do that. Now the, the next thing, so, so truth is the, is the most important thing. But I'm, and I'm talking about emotional truth as well as, as well as universal truth. So maybe I can give them an illustration of that. Um, most of us here would feel that we're not afraid of death. Right? Some are, but most here feel that they're not afraid of death. However, I, I would put to you that almost every one of you is afraid of death. The ones who feel that they're not afraid of death uh, have intellectually shut down the feeling by actually learning a lot of stuff about the spirit world and a lot of stuff about um, you know what God has done and everything and they've pumped their mind full of that stuff that they believe it they believe that stuff but there's still an emotion inside of them that is not yet released and until you release that emotion you will be afraid of death and until you release that emotion, you'll cry at funerals. And until you release that emotion, you will connect to people on telly who have died, or you'll connect to bushfire victims who have died, or you know, you will connect emotionally to all of these events. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When you have fully released that emotion, you will not be afraid of death personally. You will never modify your own truth to suit somebody who's angry with you. You will also never be afraid of any situation, whether it's heights or you know, all other physical type of situations that you may be confronted with and you will not be afraid of what will happen in your life in the future from anything that you've ever done. Now, you can imagine how freeing that is. Right? That's a very freeing place to be. But that's what will happen when you release that emotion at the emotional level. So I can say to myself, I'm not afraid of death, and I've heard many say it, but I can feel the fear of death in them still and what, how it's affecting their life through childhood events that they've actually denied. And when they release that event, their life will just be so free uh, that you know, they'll, they'll not even recognise themselves hard, hardly. And that's just with one emotion, the yeah. fear of death. Imagine multiplying that with the fear of sex or the shame of sex or the, you know, the fear of you know, anger or the fear, you know, the fear of doing what you want and the, you know, all these other emotions that are within you. Imagine multiplying that, that every one of those that comes out is going to change your life. You can start to understand how much we have that inside of us that we've just suppressed and zipped off, if you like, from our mind and control. So what most people I find have is this, this huge blockage across here, I suppose you could say, where they've pushed down all of this emotion and intellectually now tell themselves that there's no, nothing left to deal with. Right? But it's not a real state, and sooner or later that state's going to come crushing down on you, whether it's here on Earth or in the spirit world. But in terms of starting, I mean, if, if you want to, if you really feel you want to progress and deal with your emotions, but you feel like there's nothing there in, in your childhood, if you set your intention and your desire um, and pray about okay. I want to um, I want to discover what's the back there that I haven't dealt with. The law of attraction will work really quickly as long as you're as long as you've got your eyes open in your own life. Situations and people will start to appear, um, and if you remain open emotionally just to whatever's happening there, you'll find it will lead you back um, to a childhood experience usually. Yeah. So your law of attraction is a lovely way. It's really God's messenger of truth to you. 
and, and telling you what your real emotional condition is. So we can often deny our real emotional condition, but the law of attraction is always telling us our real emotional condition. So there'll be all sorts of attraction events and like myself and Mary notice even things right down to just what's happening when we're driving the car and who's in front of us and what's happening, you know, the slow person this morning who was driving the car around the corner while we were coming onto the freeway that just passes through here, like, you know, there was this, there was this tourist from, from Melbourne, by the looks, from Victoria, driving the cars on the on-ramp, but it was an 80k zone and he was driving at about 40 or 30 or something just pottering along and never going to join into the traffic and you know there's a law of attraction event that, that affected us so therefore we created it so therefore we need to look at the emotion that we felt at that instant and the average person will get angry with that driver yeah well we could feel the people in the car behind who was a local driver he was very angry and he just he just pulled out and drove off, you know, and looked at the guy. He didn't beep at him or anything, but was really upset with him. He was projecting lots of anger, so yeah, most people would get angry in those situations. Just blame the other person. Yeah, mm -hmm. whereas it was his law of attraction this was happening as well, mm -hmm. the, the man's behind us. Yeah. And, and you were able to process that fast now? Um, not all the time, but the majority of the time. Uh, there are emotions that are within me that I'm still having trouble accessing. Uh, most of them are to do with some really specific things about my relationship with God or my relationship with my soul. Um, the majority of other emotions I process really rapidly. They happen as it happens. So I, as I start talking about it, I start crying. I don't, it doesn't get put off or anything like that. It stresses Mary out sometimes. Although she's, you don't feel stressed about it much anymore. No. In the beginning, when we met, uh, it was quite stressful for Mary because, you know, sometimes we start talking and all of a sudden I start crying. <laughs> so yeah. Every time you look at Mary, you turn, you turn to tears. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning, it was like that. So, <laughs> so is tears the only way to process tears? No, no, not the only way. Excuse me, just on, the, on, on that, the anger way, the driver behind you guys, he got really angry and sort of pulled out and went past everything like that. Now, that, was that a good thing for him? He it's was, a good he thing was less feeling the emotion. I might have just... It's better for him to be feeling quietly. the emotion rather than seethe quietly, yeah. certainly. Yeah. But he was still projecting emotion at the other person, which is damaging to his own soul and right. the other person. Okay. So what he needs to do is actually step... What he would have been better off doing is pulling off on the side of the road, right? Start bashing the steering wheel and really connecting with his anger and really owning it himself rather than projecting it at the other person. Projecting it internally, basically. Or, or oh, no, just expressing it. So just yeah. banging, you know, like banging a steering wheel and start <coughs> yelling and swearing or whatever and, and just really allow it to happen. Now, if he did that, there's, there's a high likelihood that within about 15 seconds he would connect with some sadness. And the sadness was that this old fellow, and I talked about it with, the, with Mary, the old fellow who was driving at the front, he had, he had the emotion that he wasn't going to get out of the way for nobody. Right? That was his emotion. And that triggered the emotion of the guy behind us so much that he was in a rage. Because, you know, if, you have the, if somebody has the emotion towards you, I'm not getting out of the way for you. How do you feel? <laughs> you feel like you've been you know, belittled, you've been treated as if you're unimportant and so forth. And that's what this guy, unknowing to himself, was actually feeling. But, but rather than feeling that, he got angry, you know, just floored, floored his car and took off sort of thing. Yeah. And, and, and neglected that entire opportunity to deal with the childhood emotion. <laughs> he wouldn't have known it was a childhood emotion though, necessarily. And you don't need to know. If, no. if he just pulled on the side of the road and just bashed, he would have soon connected to the childhood emotion. So what are the other ways? Do you mind saying what the other ways are? Remember that I said the first way was truth. So that, that's, that's very, very important. The second way, the second important thing is actually setting your intention. Yeah, I'm talking about processing too. Setting your intention to process emotion. Do you understand? Like, if you don't have an intention set, and it's a real firm intention and desire within your soul, then you will not process emotion. You just will not. So the intention has to be there. 
Now, if you're not processing the emotion right now, you have to be truthful about your intention. The truth is you don't want it. You can say you want it all you like, but the truth is what is happening right now is my truth. So if right now I know I'm sad but I'm not crying, then I don't want to cry. And then, the, so the third thing I would do is start looking at all the reasons why I don't want to. So look at all the fears. Remember yesterday I suggested a fear list and an anger list. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to start addressing the fear list and an anger list and let yourself start seeing the reason why you're afraid of dealing with your emotion. Allow yourself to start seeing what's going on inside of yourself. So, so when people start their fear list often, we, we did a workshop uh, in <coughs> September after, I think it was after I visited you last, but we, we had a group of about 20 people or so in each workshop. There were 80 people that did it all together. And we just had one day at a time. And I, when I said, please make a fear list, that most people make a fear list and they have five things on it. And then they'd get together in a group and they'd get to talk with the other people in their fear list and eventually they'd finish up writing everybody's fear list down from every... because all of them finished up having much the same fear list. And many of them said after, the, after they did that exercise, they started with three to five items by themselves. And by the time they finished the exercise, they had a whole couple of pages of fears that they actually had, that they never knew they really had and never would, had admitted to themselves. So this is where it takes you being back to the truth issue again. It takes being truthful with yourself. That's a very important thing. <coughs> so truth is, is, is paramount. Intention. And then looking at your blockages. So looking at your blockages has to do with a fear list and an anger list. They are your blockages to dealing with emotion. And the more important thing than all of those put together is prayer. Like, the more you set your intention to talk to God about how you're feeling at every moment, the more conscious you will be of how you're feeling at every moment. And that, that means then that you can get inspiration from God and also from your spirit guides to actually assist you to identify the emotions. And you will be far more conscious then of your law of attraction. So the law of attraction with these other things can just help you identify the emotions so rapidly if you want to see them. And then to process the emotion, there, there's no, um, like sometimes, a lot of the time I will be crying, and if that's scary, then there's an, there's an emotion about crying itself, mm. and I had that emotion as well. Mm. Oh, I can't spend all my day crying, oh, if I start crying I'll never stop crying, you know. Um, so that was a block for me to work through. So a lot of time when I do process it is crying, but it's like, Every emotion is just sort of, sometimes I think about it as a, some energy that's trapped inside me from, mm. from a long time ago. So whatever it is that helps me let that out. Um, but it, the way that God has designed us means that we don't need a technique, you know, we just need to go with whatever, sometimes it's making sounds, sometimes it's bashing things, sometimes it's shaking, sometimes it's crying. Um, because the, the truth is most of the emotions that we have shut down have been sad or fearful or angry emotions. So a lot of our processing does look like that in the end. Yeah. Because yeah. remember you're dealing here with the shutdown emotions from your childhood. Obviously when you were happy it was very, well not always, but usually it's much rarer to have that shut down. Like by somebody. So having a ch happy child who's nice and calm and peaceful and just doing its own thing, most parents are real happy with that, right? So they don't shut that down. <laughs> but what if the child goes into being boisterous in their joy, then often the parent will shut that down. So one of the emotions that we'll need to deal with is being shut down from being having this real joyful, boisterous spirit and nature. So that's something that we'll need to release, and to do release that, we'll often allow us need to allow ourselves to get real joyful and boisterous and yell and scream and, mm. and have fun with it. So that's one emotion that we will experience, obviously. Mm. But there's obviously many others that have been shut down, and remember, every single one that's shut down is locked down inside of you. Mm. And when so when it flows, whatever you would experience at that time when you were a child, that's what you'll be experiencing. Mm. 
So if it's sadness, it will be crying. If it's, if it's terror, you'll be shaking. If it's, uh, if it's anger, you'll be yelling and screaming and cursing. <laughs> if it's any of the other types of emotions, you will have a physical response to every one of those. If it's shame, you'll feel this weird waves of heat coming through you and this you know, feeling of, of like fear and heat coming through. If it's sexual shame, then you'll feel this dirty sexual feeling coming through you. It just depends on what the emotion is that was shut down at the time. Any other questions? Um, just going back to you talking about fear of death. Yep. Um, again, I'm not sure what my question is, but I just know that I've experienced... Um, I, I did a lot of, I guess, extreme sports, mountain climbing and ice climbing, mm -hmm. and almost, almost sort of kind of sought out death, I had a death wish, or, yep. Yep. but was addicted to that? Yes, that's a, it's a very common thing, yeah, particularly with males is. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I wondered what that, what that is. Yeah. And what, what it is, is that uh, when we have a fear of something, generally what we try to do intellectually is we start trying to conquer it. So we start trying to conquer fear rather than feel fear. So, so often what we will do then, and, and this is very much a, uh, um, something that many men do as well, is that they try to conquer their fear by, by not actually feeling their fear, but actually conquering it by doing things that are fearful. Now what that does is it heightens the entire body system's sense of fear, which pumps <coughs> adrenaline through, through your entire body. And then you can become hooked on the adrenaline because that's a drug of it that the body produces naturally. And it creates some very awesome highs in, in you. This feeling of euphoria and the feeling of accomplishment and all of those kind of feelings are created by this adrenaline being pumped through you. And you can become addicted to that, that drug that your body produces being pumped through you at these times. All, of that, do, all that does is actually still mask the underlying fear. So, so the problem is, is it doesn't still address the issue of fear. What it does is it helps us to try to overcome the fear, but it doesn't actually help us address it by feeling the fear. Once we feel and release the fear itself, the feeling or desire to overcome it also disappears. So in other words, we're not driven then into damaging, self-damaging or self-harming type situations in order to overcome our fears. Were you the lady who was talking yesterday about not being very in touch with your body at one time? Mm. Yeah. Do you know where that came from? Uh, no. Sometimes as well when you're really not in touch with your body, you might do things to try and like challenge that as well. Like it's almost like a complete disregard, but also a um, I don't really know how to explain it. A way of feeling your body. Yeah. 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 I, I certainly Is, had did that you sense identify as well. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. it was only when I was in an extreme situation that I could feel alive. That could feel your body. Yeah. 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 So there's something really big about that from your childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the key is if you allow yourself to feel that terror and fear, but feel it in a way that you can't overcome it. So probably the best way would be to maybe lie down and just pray to God and ask just to, to feel the feelings and emotions and allow this fear to come up, whatever is within you. You may need a little practice with it, but you may find you start shaking and everything like that. That's when you'll start experiencing a, a childhood event that has driven a lot of this behaviour. And, and that child event will be a terrifying event, so you'll need to allow yourself to actually uh, experience uh, the terror. Uh, uh, terror is a difficult emotion to experience, and I've, I've had uh, quite a lot of it to deal with in my own life. And um, it can be very, very difficult to experience uh, unless you... It's very difficult to experience because you don't feel safe while you're experiencing it. And so that's why it's quite difficult to experience. And you're terrified at the time you're experiencing it. Mm. But if it's childhood terror, it needs to come out of you like any other emotion from your childhood. So it, what I used to do is just allow myself to say, oh, this, is just, this is just past stuff coming out of me now. I, didn't get, I, I tried to continue to just 
observe it, I suppose you could say, and I don't mean not experience it by that. Um, what I mean is to just remind myself that God was with me, I can feel this, I can get through this. But, uh, but I was often very terrified while experiencing it. So I had a, I had a whole period of my life uh, for quite a few months where every single morning and night I had these, what you would only call terror fits, mm -hmm. that lasted a few hours at a time, um, just releasing my own terror from my own life. And, uh, and then as I, was, as I would release that, eventually after three months it all just disappeared completely. And I, I, didn't, I, didn't ha I haven't had that since. Can I just make a comment on what you're saying about fear? Um, I feel sorry for the guys that are coming back from Afghanistan and coming back from Iraq at the moment. When I was in the army in 54 or 55, 57, it was a serious crisis. Yep. Now, if anybody in here has been in the army, they've been a pack of bundle, yep. and they've had the hard work put on them day in, day out for about 48 days. Yep. So the point is, they will shout at you, so they're shouting right into your brain, right into your eyes. That's it. You become, and the, the symptoms are burning, dryness, yeah. wanting to cry, yeah. or wanting to die. Yeah. Now you have that probably for 10 minutes while somebody's yelling at you. Yeah, that's right. And the point is that sometime in their future, they're going to be confronted with that or more, just yeah. exactly like our boys now. That's right. Yeah. I just wonder whether anybody's at the other end of this, was on TV the other they can explain exactly the same thing, that those boys can sort of reach out to themselves now. Yeah. Because there's a lot of guys on this world of the same age as I am, I am sure, yeah. that we're still fighting some of those little fears. Exactly. That we had from when I was a kid in the war. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So all what we're saying here, we, have, we all have fears. It doesn't matter how old we are. Mm. But it's that burning, that wanting to cry, yeah. That blistering heat you get to the back of your throat. Yeah. If you've got that, that's fear. Yeah. And the really key is to allow yourself to connect. It to is. That. It is. It's I'm saying I've got it now. Yeah. It's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. Yeah. And if that's the nearest you'll get to. It, yeah. And the, the beauty is with all of these emotions, if you involve God in the process, you can actually work through these emotions quite rapidly as long as you allow them to flow. It's it's when you block them up and freeze them up that they then get carried around with you for the rest of your life. And that's what's so difficult for people who have been in traumatic situations. And so people who have been to war or been in wars have often been in a constant traumatic situation that entire time. Mm. And, and there's all this emotion stored in them that they need to release. And this is why many came back from Vietnam with what they call post-traumatic stress mm. syndrome now, which is just a lovely name to put to some very, very raw emotions that need to be felt and experienced. And the key is to allow them to be felt and experienced. So my, I feel a little sad in, in terms of the world today doesn't allow the experience of these emotions. What, what it's trying to do is shut down the experience of these emotions. And the problem is, is that people can't recover from those events unless they're allowed to experience the emotion. Mm. And so, yeah. The whole point of what they do at Pakapanyal is to make you shut it down. Oh, so definitely. That, mm. yeah, They'll put yourself people up in the end, so yeah. go down on that road. There's only one thing to do. Yeah. You'll either sort of say, I don't want this anymore, and you'll drop off the top of your head or commit suicide, which yeah. I saw. Yeah. Quite a few guys who couldn't take it. Yeah. What you say, just block out that fear. Yeah, exactly. It's a total blockage. Yeah. And it's very, very hard to break. Yeah. Very even deep. now. Yeah. From those days. Very hard. Yeah. And the key the key for people who have trauma experienced traumatic events, um, obviously <coughs> there needs to be far more acknowledgement and also far more um, things available to them without judgment to deal with these events. Yeah. And unfortunately, the world we live in now is geared very much towards getting everyone to be normal again so rapidly that they're, that they're not concerned too much about whether it happens in a real sense or whether it's just fictional or, maintain, or maintained by drugs or other methods. And so it would be much better if we could all re, you know, get back to this, this core emotion, dealing with the core emotion. Because the truth is that when you pass in the spirit world, whatever core emotion you have not dealt with here, you will need to deal with there anyway. So you may as well deal with it now. Now is always the best time. Yeah. Any other questions? That 
I just would like a sort of clarification or expansion on the difference between your personal truth and divine truth. I'm not, I'm not really clear on either of them, actually. Okay. Um, personal truth is anything that you believe to be true yourself. So, for example, uh, remember an example I used yesterday when I said Mary was over in the corner and I was over here and I wanted to meet Mary and my personal truth is I wanted to meet Mary and then I made a couple of steps towards her and then all these other personal truths started kicking in, which was I'm unworthy to meet her. Now, that's a personal truth. Truth or belief? Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's the same thing. Same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's an emotion within me. So a personal truth of the emotion within me is I am unworthy to meet Mary. God's truth is I'm totally worthy to meet anyone. Right? That's God's truth. So can you see how my truth might be very, very different to God's truth? Right? So God's truth is I'm completely worthy to meet absolutely any person on this planet or in the spirit world for that matter and I'm even worthy to meet God. So therefore, I'm worthy to meet every other person. Right? That's the truth. But, and I'd call that the absolute truth, or God's truth. But my truth is, because of this emotion in me, I don't even feel worthy to meet Mary. That's my truth. Okay, so it's synonymous with perception or belief or something. Yes. Like now it's very important for me to acknowledge my truth. In other words, to speak the truth about my truth before the emotion will flow. So in other words, I could say, I could make these two steps towards Mary, and then I could say, oh, I feel unworthy. And then I could say, oh, but hang on a sec, God says I'm worthy, so I'm worthy. And I could try to keep going, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. But I'm denying a personal truth in that moment. The personal truth in that moment is I'm not worthy, and I need to experience that unworthiness and release it from me before I will really feel God's truth. So in the end, all I'm doing is just telling myself God's truth, I'm worthy, when in reality I'm feeling totally the opposite, that I'm unworthy. Right? And it's when our truth gets in harmony with God's truth that we get closer to God. Now the only way that our truth can get in harmony with God's truth is for us to release our error. And the only way that we can release that which we believe to be true, is to experience it emotionally. So I would have to experience the emotion of feeling unworthy for Mary. When I experience that emotion and release it at the causal level, I will actually now feel worthy, not only just for Mary, but any other woman on the planet. That's the emotions in, emotions out type of thing. Yes. So you can't... Um, in the Paget messages we said to James Paget that Truth and error can't exist in the same place at the same time. What we meant by that was that the emotional truth and the emotional error cannot exist in the same soul at the same time. So in other words, let's look at this issue of unworthiness. If I feel unworthy within my soul, within myself, no matter how much I tell myself intellectually that God says I'm worthy, I will continue to feel unworthy until I release the unworthy emotion from my soul. Once I release the unworthy emotion from my soul, the real truth can also enter me emotionally, that I am worthy. And once that truth has entered me emotionally, not intellectually, my entire life will change. My entire law of attraction will change. But you can't, you can't initiate the release, you have to wait for an opportunity to happen, is that right? You can initiate release, yes. Yeah, the way you initiate release. Without coal though, and you can't do it so cold. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. You can have total control of the entire process if you tell yourself the truth. So if you know you're unworthy, you could then start really sitting with that, praying to God to expose the issues within you that are unworthy. You could actually lay down and spend time each day laying down and actually feeling the unworthy feelings that you feel and start allowing a connection to them. You can actually do things actively to connect to them. proactive about it rather than waiting for something to initiate it. Rather than waiting for the law of attraction to go bang, 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 you know, and hit you every time. Yeah. So you can allow those things. Most people don't, and that's why the law of attraction is so important. Yeah. Put it another way, we're then coordinating ourselves with our mind we've got. In a way, it's like that, yeah. 
it's in the end what will be happening is your truth will be God's truth. Yeah. That's what will happen in the that end. That is the hard one as well. Yeah. This says yes, this says no. Exactly. This says no, this says yes. That's right. <laughs> That's not hard one. Yeah. yeah. So it's very difficult uh, sometimes to progress because mm. uh, like often many of us know God's truth, right? So all of you know here in your mind that you're worthy, right? You get told this all the time. You are worthy. You're just as worthy as any other person on this planet to receive every, anything on this planet. Right? You're just as worthy. We all know this here, right? But how many of us actually feel it here? You know, not many of us really feel it here. You know, and that's the difference. Is that you know we and and I've found in my own progression that's the most difficult thing. Because I've often told myself something here and then tried to force myself to believe it here. And it never works. What I've had to do instead is actually, all right, I know that God says I'm worthy, but really that's immaterial at this point. What I need to do is feel this terrible unworthy feeling I feel right at this instance and allow myself to go into that feeling. And when you do that, the feeling is released from you and ironically, at that time, then the truth can enter you emotionally. And when it's entered you emotionally, it becomes certain a certainty in you. So the only reason why we ever feel doubt or we ever feel uncertainty is because the truth has yet to enter us emotionally. It's still just a mental thing. So for each of you, sometime in the future, for example, each of you will know for a certainty whether I, whether I am Jesus or not. Each of you will know for a certainty. Because that truth will enter you for a certainty into your emotions. The truth of whether I am or not will enter you. And you'll know for a certainty. Up until now, you might say, yeah, I think he might be, or no, I don't think he is, or oh, what he says is interesting, or whatever it is that's going on in the mind. But until the truth enters you emotionally, you will not be ever certain. Right? And it's the same with every other thing in your life. You will never be certain of it until the truth enters you emotionally, then you'll be certain. I woke up in a cold sweat one night yeah. and realised profoundly I was worthy. Yeah. How has that happened? And usually a lot of processing happens in our sleep state. And in our sleep state, we, we are just like we are now. We are people talking with each other, talking to other people. And we're learning a lot. So every time you're asleep and your spirit body and your soul exits your material body, your material body is resting and recovering and regenerating. But your spirit body and your soul is off doing things. Right? So, and you're off doing things in the spirit world. Talking with people, realizing things, having recognition and so forth. And so for many of us, we're doing a lot of processing in our sleep state as well. A lot of emotional processing. And many of that, much of that emotional processing enters us through, the, through dreams or through realisations that we have at the time of waking. And that helps us to progress at the awake state as level as well. The key is eventually you'll have a seamless existence. So you'll remember every sleep state experience as much as you remember every awake state experience. Well, I sort of thought I'd die. Yep, and so gone to heaven or something. I found myself taking my pulse. Yep. And I think what had happened... Was I gone beyond my mind? Yes. But realised I wasn't my mind. Exactly. Yeah. Or my body. And you felt that emotionally. Yeah. Instead of just an intellectual awesome. concept. Yeah. 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 It was a totally energetic experience because my mind couldn't reason exactly or understand. And these are the best experiences. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. And they are also yes. the most powerful experiences. Very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Changed my life. And you can have them in the sleep state and the awake state or in the merging of the two states. So many of you are having many realisations in the sleep state that are yet to catch up with you in the awake state. And then you're having realisations in the awake state. And all of these things are a part of your progression. What will happen when you actually enter the spirit world is you'll remember all of your sleep state experiences and all of your awake state experiences. So they'll become, if you haven't done it before then, they'll become like one experience. And they'll all merge together and everything will make sense right down to why you felt like you had to meet such and such at a certain time at a certain place or why you had to be at a certain place on earth at a certain time. All of that will all make sense to you when you reach that state because you'll see 
how the interaction occurred between the sleep states and the awake state in setting up these events. Yeah, I feel everything that happens is meant to happen. It's all travelling as it should. Yeah, but it's meant to happen from the point of view of you're making it happen. <laughs> but you're making it to happen not just on this physical level. There's this spirit level mm. that's going, and every time you're in your sleep state, you're in this spirit level, and you're making a lot of things happen there too. Yeah. Well, it's certainly more spiritual than material. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So is it good to remember your dreams or analyze them then? How you feel if you remember a lot of that? Always how you feel. Yeah. So, so if you wake up from a dream feeling afraid, don't. So you don't need to analyze the dream. What you need to do is feel afraid. Did, did you follow me? Like, um, well, a lot, of, a lot of times we wake up from a dream. Analyzing it, trying to make sense of it, and a lot of them are a uh, very like mixture of real things in the sleep state that have occurred, mixed with some of the when you when you re-enter your body, there's some things that happen physiologically where where all sorts of memories come up from all sorts of things um, that are mixed together with the sleep state experience. So if you try to analyze it intellectually you're going to really struggle with, with, with working out what's actually happened. The best thing to do is to feel the emotion of the dream. So what was the emotion of the dream? So let's say you had a dream this morning and you finished up having sex with your next door neighbour in the dream. Right? And you woke up with the feeling of, of utter, utter devastation that you'd been unfaithful to the partner who's sleeping next to you. Let's say that was the feeling. Well, that's the feeling you've got to go for with. So you don't need to worry about whether that means you're attracted to your next door neighbour or any of the things like that, right? And oftentimes you won't be if you think of it, if you feel about it. What it means is there was a feeling being triggered of me affecting my partner and this terrible devastation feeling in me of how I've affected somebody else's life. So that comes from my childhood that's yet to be released. All I need to do is tune into that using that experience. Does that make sense? let myself feel that feeling. When you do that, it's a great, it, dreams are a great way of accessing emotion. Dreams are also a good way of telling you what emotions you're avoiding in the awake state. So let's say you have a dream and you're in this dream, you're just so angry, you're just angry with everyone, you're yelling and screaming at your husband and your kids and, and you wake up saying, oh I'm glad I'm not like that. Uh -huh. right? Well, actually, there is an emotion in you that is like that, that feels like that, and it's an emotion you're avoiding in your awake state, and you need to allow yourself to connect to that emotion. Does that make sense? Like often these these things will happen. Let's say you have a dream, and uh, um, I think I had a dream last night. I don't. I rarely dream myself. Did I say it to you? No, I forgot too. Yeah, we woke up at 5.30 in the morning because our alarm clock we set two nights ago went off. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to catch a plane at that time. But, um, and, and now I can't remember it, but we discussed it at the time this morning. It must have, we must have dealt with it emotionally because we both can't remember it. But um, where sometimes I wake up with a dream of all different types of things. I've had dreams of like tidal waves. Some of you may have had this of huge waves coming in at shore and you're standing on the shore and you just get hit with these huge waves. Mm -hmm. Some of you had those dreams? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And those, a lot of those dreams are forecasting future events. Where not, maybe not you are in the event, but forecasting events where, see in the sleep state, many of you know about world change events that are going to occur mm -hmm. in the future. And, and you give them, you know, these images come to you as you're transitioning the sleep and awake states. But what do you feel from? What's the feeling? If you wake up with fear, go with the fear. Let yourself feel the fear. Let yourself be terrified. Because that's the feeling that dream was there to generate. And that's the feeling you need to feel and release. How about the exhilaration of flying in your dreams, allegedly astral travelling? Yeah, uh, how many have had that? Pretty much everyone I would have thought. Yeah. And yet, yeah, many times these are just sleep state experiences. So the dream, the, the actual idea of flying over the Earth's surface, and and actually, some people are actually recognise locations that they've never seen in their awake state, and then they look up a book, and that that's the location I flew over. Things like that. 
Well, they are all actual experiences. In your sleep state, you are just as capable of hovering over the earth plane as you are spending time in the first sphere, second sphere, or wherever your soul will enable you to experience time. So if my soul development allows me to be in the third sphere of the spirit world, I can visit the third sphere, the second sphere, the first sphere, and any place on the earth plane while I'm in the sleep state. And you will at times have memories of that occurring. So enjoy them. Yeah. Sometimes they're not that enjoyable. There might be you know, feelings like you know, that you're surrounded by all these ugly people wanting to hurt you. Well, a lot of that can be actually sleep state experiences based on your emotion. The key if you wake up with that, again, is to feel the emotion. What was the emotion? Afraid or whatever, terror. Let yourself connect with the emotion. When you release the emotion, it will change you at the soul level, therefore change your soul condition, therefore change the law of attraction, and therefore change what experiences you're going to have in your sleep state. So this sort of happens in meditation, like um, if somebody goes out and they're out there and they just get totally terrified and the person doing the meditation group is struggling to get them back, is that, that total fear barrier that the, they can't get through? Yeah, what's happened in those situations is the person has gone out of body mm -hmm. and then because of their soul condition being attracted to a certain location which mm -hmm. gives them certain experiences and what we need to do to help them to, in that place is when they come back, encourage them to come back but encourage them to feel that fear and that terror. Often what we're trying to do is to calm them down, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean, to stop them from feeling those feelings. But what we need to do is actually encourage them to go into those feelings and actually fully feel them bodily. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, the next time they go into meditation, they won't be attracted to the same location. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the key is to go with the emotion rather than actually <coughs> suppress the emotion and control the emotion. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? What are your thoughts on children seeing spirits but not actually interacting with them? So they might say, I've seen a spirit, mm -hmm. but there was no talking or there didn't seem to be any messages that the spirit was giving this child. Mm -hmm. uh, there are literally millions and millions and millions of spirits who who are bound to the earth plane. And if your child is mediumistic and can see spirits, they'll see these spirits all the time. And these spirits are only interested in talking to your child if there's a law of attraction. So if there's something the spirit is interested in the child or the child is interested in the spirit or whatever, then an interaction may begin. Remember that not all spirits, uh, and in fact the far majority of spirits that are uh, located on the earth plane, are not in a very good condition. So, so sometimes your child will see these spirits and these spirits won't take any interest in them whatsoever. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's quite good for the child because the child you know, would be far better off without them taking interest in, in them. And I would, though, encourage the child's ability to see, certainly. Because if they can see spirits, it's a, one, it's a wonderful thing for their life later on. So how would you encourage that more in a child? Oh, I would just uh, just encourage when they say, "Oh, and did, what did you notice about him? You know, did he have what did he have? How old did he look? You know, just ask them and just just accept it. Have this uh, emotion in you of acceptance of their of the reality they are presenting to you because it is real. Mm -hmm. It is actually mm -hmm. a real thing that's occurring. Allow them to actually accept it within themselves. No, mummy and daddy accept this is real. Like, I, I'm being real, my mum and dad is accepting this reality. So, a few weeks ago, we did a parenting children uh, discussion, and we both met this little boy who was about, how old would he have been? Five, about four or five. And he comes up to us and he starts telling us about all of his friends. And after a little while, I realised that actually all of these friends are not friends that he has on earth. <laughs> These are all his spirit friends. They're all little boys uh, that um, are, have been attracted to this little boy because he's really mediumistic. And he's just started talking, oh, and, and such and such, I forget his name now, rides, he rides a Jaguar every day, like rides a, a Jaguar, a, a, an actual, a cheetah. A, a cheetah, sorry, a cheetah, an animal, every day. And so I started realising, yeah, this has to be a spirit event, not a spirit <laughs> on earth event. And, and these little spirits, the boys, they are, interact with him constantly. And, mum and his mum and dad accept it all the time. Um, 
they have they were starting to look at now why these little boys are attracted to him and what's going on and, and all those kind of things. And, but it, it's lovely for that boy because he, he just is totally comfortable with his own mediumship ability. And he, he says what he sees as he sees it. Yeah. So how, how, sorry, how do we do sorry, that? I haven't finished with, because she's still wanting to ask. I was just going to say, so what happens if all of a sudden your child's um, behaviour changes? Uh, this is my little boy and all of a sudden he's got really scared. And he's believing that there's robbers in the house and he's worried about burglars and all these things. And I actually thought these fears were coming from something else that was happening in his life. Um, if he's all of a sudden become us. like that and he believes there's robbers in his house, then he's certainly seen spirits in the, or your house. Robbing you. <laughs> right? Attempting to rob you, probably. But, but there may have been spirits who have owned the house previously or there could have been lots of different things you know, going on. But he has seen them. The key for, to, is to explain the truth to you. Yeah, no, they're just spirits who are around. And they, in our house, they're obviously looking for things. They can't actually hurt us in their state, particularly if we ask God you know, to protect us, we'll be right. And, and so develop his confidence in asking God to, for protection. And then um, talk to him about how he feels about these spirits being around. Did they look ugly? You know, what was their problems? You know, and things like that. And just say to them, you know, we don't have to worry too much about them, and but we can talk to them and convince them to go elsewhere if we want to. Does he want to do that? You know, just, just let him be guided by his own will um, as to what he would like to do with these spirits. Um, but he's seeing them really, really clearly. Because he sees like other spirits that don't interact with him, and he feels comfortable and all that sort of stuff, and mm -hmm. we've always encouraged that. Mm -hmm. But now these other experiences are happening, and I don't know whether it's making it worse by me talking about so openly with him. No, it's not making it worse. Or, because I don't want him to be scared of all this stuff, because he never used to be. But Whereas now... Yeah. Mary's going to say something that's important. Isn't no, oh, just is there an emotion in yourself or your partner of fear about this issue? Um... I wouldn't not, say... I wouldn't ask the question here as if it were me speaking. Uh, okay. AJ would say there is an emotion of fear in you. <laughs> but are you afraid of what it's going to mean if your son grows up seeing, you know, he's very open about it? I, no, I wouldn't have seen no. so, no. Are you afraid of spirits who are in bad condition? In your house. Um, oh, gee, I don't know. I guess I could be. Yeah, mm. I feel you are. Mm. Um, and he's starting to see some of them because your law of attraction is bringing them into the house. So the key for you is to start looking at your own emotions about spirits in bad condition and start seeing what you feel about that and release some of the fears that you have about Because I thought all this behaviour actually started from something totally different, like a situation that was going on in the family that he was having trouble dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I was putting it down to something else. Mm -hmm. And it certainly had an effect on him because he's tempted now to interact with spirits rather than people. So, um, so that event certainly has had an effect on him in terms of him, his feelings and emotions. And the key is to ask him what he feels about that event. Uh, that's you know the family events um, because because they have certainly affected him emotionally, and and his spirit sight ability has always been present, but now it's more, you know, he's more noticing it more because he's tempted to tune out of what's going on around him in the physical because of his emotions about the events. But again, how he's feeling is a reflection of your emotion, well, and both parents' emotions. So, so the key is to allow yourself to feel, what do I feel about that event that occurred? Because that's the key issue for you. And then as you deal with that emotionally, because you're quite upset about that event, as you deal with that emotionally, you'll find that his emotions about that event will actually disappear as well. Remember when your ch children are young, they are completely reflecting to you your own emotions. So he's reflecting to you your fear of spirits in, in, in poor condition, and he's also reflecting to you your concern about an emotional situation that he feels but that you're not letting yourself feel about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Children are very powerful teachers uh, of helping us access our emotions that we're denying. Yeah. Thank you.
Yeah, someone else asked, was going yeah. to ask. How, how do we as adults develop our psychic senses? Are there, or is it a blockage from young? And every single person has psychic senses. Mm -hmm. So God has uh, given that gift to every single person. Some have the gift naturally. And the reason why some have the gift naturally more than others is a combination of, firstly, soul-based injuries and soul-based desires. So when I say soul-based desires, what I'm saying is that some people have a natural ability to do things that other people can't do because they, that's a part of the, the gifts that God has given them in their creation of their soul. So for example, some of you are naturally gifted when it comes to music. Others of you are not naturally gifted when it comes to music. And you've got to learn it. You know what I mean? Um, some of you are naturally gifted when it comes to science or mathematics or English or, or literature or whatever, all these uh, different areas. Others of you don't feel naturally gifted and it's something you find very, very difficult to learn. But in the same way, a, a person who, any, every person who's born, has some natural gifts with regard to spirit communication. Some have natural gifts. All of us can develop the gift. Now, how we develop the gift is uh, my said. There's two ways to develop. One way is to grow in natural love, and the other way is to grow in divine love. They are the only two ways, in fact, to develop rapport. And um, the fastest way to develop rapport with the spirit world is to grow in divine love, because when you grow in divine love, your soul changes. In, in its abilities and, and its own, it, it, its actual physical structure changes. And when its physical structure changes, it actually changes in the ways in which you can communicate with other people. Now at the moment, most of us are communicating by having a feeling, then that gets translated into a thought, that gets translated into language, that then gets spoken through our voice. The other person who's on the hearing end he is the voice and the modulation and, uh, and the frequencies of that voice. The brain translates that into, a, into recognition of signals, which are then recognised and compared with language. That language is then converted into feelings inside of the person. Now, you can see that that whole process is fraught with all sorts of misunderstandings. Because my feeling and your feeling might be totally different from me saying the same saying one thing and you thinking I said something completely different or feeling something completely different than I felt. So I could say to you, oh, what a stupid idiot you are, right, in a joke, and the other person feeling the emotion on the other end could be feeling that they've just been attacked and been told they're an idiot, right, when that wasn't the feeling that I had inside of myself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, as you progress on the divine love path, what happens is your ability to feel the emotion intensifies. Feel the emotions from every person. Now as that intensifies, it means that the communication that occurs between the two of you now isn't just intellectual anymore. It's now emotional. And it's now what I call soul-to-soul -soul communication. Now when you enter a process of soul-to-soul -soul communication, every single spirit in the spirit world who are above the eighth sphere of the spirit world, so, that, so we're talking the eighth sphere and above, Every single spirit in that location communicates in that way. So if you don't develop yourself in that way in terms of emotionally, you will never be able to communicate with any of those spirits, which are in fact the highest developed spirits in the universe. The only spirits you'll be able to communicate with are the ones who communicate intellectually, which are up to the sixth sphere of the spirit world. But the more you develop yourself in love, the more you develop yourself either in natural love or divine love causes a stronger, what I would call, rapport or connection between you and the spirit world in anybody in the same condition. So if I'm a murderer and I'm mediumistic, the people that I'm probably going to connect to the most in the spirit world are the murderers that are still in the spirit world. So they'll all be in the first sphere, in one of the hells of the first sphere, and they'll be the people that I connect to quite constantly. So I'll hear lots of very, very fascinating information from them, which will probably be very damaging to my soul and theirs, right, because of the rapport that I have. But if I then develop myself in love and I grow to the second sphere in terms of, in terms of the love that I have within myself, then the people that communicate to me the most easily will be the people in the second sphere of the spirit world who are in the same condition of love that I, that I am in. 
And this is very important to understand for the transmission of lots and lots of information. There are literally billions of spirits in the spirit world waiting to communicate with people on earth and help the earth. But the problem is it requires a person on earth with the same desires and with development in love that they can connect to that is the same as theirs. So for example, in the spirit world there are many scientists who would like to connect with scientists on earth. The problem is that the majority of scientists on earth don't even believe in the spirit world. Mm. <laughs> right? So, all of that information that these scientists have in the spirit world that they would like to transmit to earth, they can't do. And yet the people who would be the most easily communicated this information to would be another scientist. And so, can you see how like, that's a limiting, like huge amounts of information coming to earth just in the scientific area, for example. And if we multiply that by every avenue of human endeavour, you can see how much that we are limiting communication with the spirit world. So the key is to get yourself in the condition of love and then follow your passion. So if your passion happens to be science, follow your passion. If your passion happens to be the arts, follow the passion. If your passion happens to be music, follow the passion. And what will happen is that will attract spirits who are in the same condition of love as you, who are also following that passion, who can inspire you to do all sorts of things that you would never be able to normally do. And, it's a, and, and this is the way in which the spirit world and the earth work state is going to become a seamless integrated state. And we'll be eventually getting to the place where we'll be having conversation here like we are and there's literally hundreds of spirits here with us. In fact there's quite a few thousand spirits with us today. And we would be able to see all of them spirits at the same time as we're having this conversation and they would be able to also communicate to us and ask the questions they want to ask instead of having to be asked through a person because all of us could see the interaction occur because we're all now open in all of these different ways that God created us to be open. So that's a pretty good place to be and in the future that's what will be happening. Okay. Is that what's um, um, spoken about when we talk about the, the new age and the frequency shifts? And the exactly. When people talk about these metaphysical uh, constructs of, meta, you know, of frequency shifts on the planet and new age and you know all that, all we're really talking about are the soul changes that are going to occur, that are going to create this great deal of rapport between the spirit world and, and, and the human world, which God created and God cre intended to exist right from the beginning, uh, but which our own fear and our own errors and our own emotional uh, desires led us down a path away from that. And all we're doing now is recovering all of that. So you know how like, you've got the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, for example, built by some amazing technology that mankind, even today, can't understand how it ever got built. Well, the reason why, the people who built that are in the spirit world waiting to talk to people. But they just can't, because no one's in a state where they want to listen, you know. And they can show you how that got built. And, they, and we can build all sorts of things using similar techniques. But, uh, and all of them are spiritual techniques, where there was no labour involved. Uh, but these are all things that are possible, but unfortunately, because of our state, we're resistive. And this involves getting people on, hopefully, the divine love path. This means probably that they are they're shifting their vibrational frequency, for lack of a better word, from the first level yeah. up to maybe second or third or something like yeah. that, while they're still physically incarnated. Let's correct the word vibrational frequency. Okay, Let's call it love. <laughs> okay, because if you understand it to be love, you'll understand it as the emotion of love. The so-called vibrational frequency, that's what it is. It is the vibration or the emotion of love. So the people in the second sphere are in a totally different emotional condition of love than the people in the first sphere. The people in the eighth sphere are in just this to totally different... You can think each degree of love is like ten times the one before, if you like. Mm -hmm. So the one in the eighth sphere are like millions and millions and millions of times more powerful in love than the person in the first sphere. Mm -hmm. And if you think of it as love, then you won't go astray in your own development. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you think of it as a vibration, you'll try to manufacture a vibration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a natural love path too. And that's yeah. what the natural love path does. Yeah. But it's actually love that we're talking about. That is what, when, we talk, when, when the New Age philosophies talk about vibrational and frequency and 
higher vibrations and all that. If you just pull all of those words back to love, a higher degree of love, you will understand the spirit world far more than any person talking about a vibrational frequency. Okay. Back to um, the Sorry. Sorry. This might be moving sideways a little. Um, nature spirits, are there in fact entities or spirits who assist and will govern or assist um, the plant kingdom? Uh, yes. Um, Remember that every one of you here is a person, right? Each of you have unique desires. Some of you have a really, really strong rapport with nature. Agree? Some of you have a strong rapport with animals more than plants. Others of you have a stronger rapport with plants rather than animals. Some of you have a stronger rapport with birds rather than animals, and so forth. Agree? When you pass, what do you think you will do? Yeah. Wouldn't you follow that passion? Yeah. Now, the so-called nature spirits, all they are is people who are on earth who are following their passions in the spirit world to do with different avenues of nature. That's all, that's all they are. They're just people like you who have passed and following their passion in a certain direction. So fairies and devas and hobgoblins, etc. are a fantasy? Um, all of them are... Um, they are entities who are portraying themselves as something different than they are in order to gain attention. Ah. Right. Ego trippers. Well, you can say that. <laughs> you can say that. Because as a spirit, you are able to portray an image to a person that is not your true self. And so you can portray an image of a little goblin, or you can portray an image of all sorts of things. You can even materialise for certain short periods of time images of things on earth. And as you grow in your ability of love, remember not vibration but love, you get the eighth sphere, you'll actually be able to materialise a human form and walk on the earth for a period of time, do something here and then go back to home where you were. Now the so-called goblins and fairies and all those, these are ones who have materialised a lot of times from first sphere locations and, and a lot of times they are interacting with people on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all they are. They're just still people, but portraying themselves to be something different than they are in order to get your attention. Because if they just arrived as a, in their normal form, many of you wouldn't bother having a look at them. <laughs> right? You'd just ignore them. <laughs> Okay, why do we um, keep mentioning 2012? What's the significance of that date? Do we just like the numbers or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about this a bit last night, weren't we guys? And uh, there, there is... The, the Earth and the universe, the physical universe itself is totally based... Uh, besides being based on, on love, there are, there are rules of mathematics governing the universe. These rules of mathematics are, are cyclical, as are many of the rules and, and of mathematics governing the Earth itself. And the Earth is under the control of many of these rules of mathematics. Um, and the Earth goes through periods of regeneration as a result. But the soul condition of man determines the survivability of these particular events. So what I mean by that is that, that, that God has put into place events that occur in the universe for the constant regeneration of the universe. The universe is always changing. But if man has the appropriate soul condition, none of these change events would ever affect man negatively. They would all be positive effects on man as well. The problem that we have today though is that the, the change events that are happening on earth um, man are not very connected to. And historically, that's also been the case. And so many billions of men, people, men and, men and women, have died in the past because of not being connected to these change events. So again, everything gets back down to the soul condition. So my suggestion is not worry too much about, like, we could discuss for hours and hours what might happen over the next leading towards 2012. But at the end of the day, it's going to be very dependent, the intensity of those events, the the, uh, this, the amount of impact they have on the earth and the amount of impact they have in terms of survivability 
is all going to be dependent upon man's soul condition. Mm. So we could waste a lot of time talking about the events when in reality it would be better if we, waste, if we spend a lot of time not wasted talking about the soul condition that will help these events. So my feelings are, while we can talk about all of these events and there are certainly going to be many events affecting the earth in every location of the earth, None of, those, none of those discussions actually do much for most people except create more fear in them, which is actually lowering their soul condition. <laughs> so I'd much rather spend time talking about what are you afraid of about 2012 than talk about the events that would occur in 2012 or before that. Well, it, just, it just keeps popping up in your main calendar. Yeah. And just everyone seems to have focused on 2012. Well, I mean, there is 2013 and, you know... <laughs> The truth is that God's intention is that the earth continues to exist. Doesn't, doesn't everything happen by God's grace, so why worry? Exactly. That's very true too. The, the important thing to understand is that a lot of these things about 2012 are coming from spirits in the natural love path in the spirit world. They have known for many, many years that these earth change events are going to occur. They have not understood why they are going to occur because the majority of the spirits on the natural love path do not understand the soul. They only understand the soul as being the spirit body. And so they don't understand the soul and its law of attraction and all of these other things that you're being taught now about the soul. And so what they do is they, they project into the future because their time is not a constraint for them. They can project different things occurring on the earth, not to a high degree of accuracy, because they're not factoring in many of the soul condition changes that will occur between now and then. So many of them have for the last 50 or 60 years in particular been channeling to people on earth things like, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, the earth change events that are coming up um, have been channeled over the last, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years, even ones like Nostradamus, like three or four or five hundred years ago, thousand years ago, have been told things from spirits that have then been channeled. Now, now, obviously the degree of accuracy of those events uh, will depend very much upon the soul condition of mankind at the time the events occur. So the truth is that every single person on earth could survive these events. It's not going to happen. But the truth is that it could happen if everyone at the soul level decided to start doing their soul work. Well, that's what's happening, isn't it? Everyone, it's gathering momentum. It's gathering momentum, yes, certainly. Um, but, but uh, and, and we'll continue to gather momentum, and hopefully the 14 who have returned will be like a catalyst for that to just continue and grow really, really rapidly. And so that's the reason why we returned at this particular time in human history. But that all being said, uh, there will still be loss of life and there will still be trauma on Earth because... Not everyone will use their free will to, to, to change in a positive <coughs> way. The key for us individually is to start doing our own soul work, connect to God, allow, us, allow ourselves to follow our passions and our desires. As we do that, we'll be led to safe places on earth that we'll want to live in, and this will automatically happen. We won't have to worry about any of those things anyway. Yeah, like it's personal reality. You can't really change the world can change yourself. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So these are earthwide or worldwide events are certainly going to occur. The intensity of them occurring is totally dependent upon the soul condition of mankind. And the way, the fastest way to change your soul condition is by praying for divine love to enter your soul and working through your emotions. Could I add to the comment, it's not, um, you said um, you can't change the world, you can only change yourself. I would say the only way you can change the world is to change yourself. Well, that, that follows on. That's, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, because it will actually change the world. Yeah. If everybody does their job. Mm -hmm. Well, even one person getting into a state of one on the earth will have a huge impact in the world. Just one person. Mm -hmm. And so imagine if a hundred did it, uh, or a thousand did it. But it, it just takes one person being in a state of one with God for everyone to start realising that, oh, wow, that's what I want. <laughs> and then them causing, it causing them to make changes too. So most, most people rely on something outside themselves to change. They want the system to change and then everything will be all right. So exactly. therefore you control it. Exactly. 
So mm -hmm. what you want instead is to change yourself. Mm -hmm. Then everything around you will be good change. Mm -hmm. I need to go and do a week. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else need to do that? <laughs> Let's have a break for everyone. <laughs> Ready? Ready to continue? <coughs> so, one, two. Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one, two. I'm going to ask you to define love. And the older we get, the more we find it hard to define love. It's been so caught anything from the kitchen sink on. Please define and clear us, will you? Define love. Um, it's, I suppose a lot of times you could easily define it by what it's not. Yeah. But let's try and define it by what it is, shall we? That's a very good answer because that's the truth of it, isn't it? You can only say what it isn't. Yeah. Well, if you said that, you wouldn't have much left, would you? Yeah. But there, there, is a, there is ways to clearly define, define love. But can I just divide love, firstly, into two sides? There's the love that you have that comes from within yourself. And that love is what I call the natural love. And that love I can certainly define quite easily. But there is another love, and that's the love that comes from God into you. So that's what I call the divine love. And I've spent my lifetime trying to define that, and still cannot define it. I can define what the qualities are from it, and all of the feelings and emotions from it. But the problem with defining that love, the divine love, God's love, is that um, it's such a powerfully blissful emotion that it's impossible to describe with any words that we have here on earth. And so therefore very, very difficult to define unless I can give you the feeling. But the problem is I can't give you the feeling because only God can. Because it's God's love that enters your soul. So while we can divide, I can define the natural love, so if we, we look at the word love, we can certainly define love. But when it comes to actually defining God's love, you will only ever find the definition through your own experience of the divine love. And so there's actually billions and millions of spirits who have experienced that love to the point of one with God, which is the eighth sphere of their progression. And all of those spirits have received divine love to the point that they know they're now immortal, but they still have a lot of trouble defining that love to another person who has not experienced the love, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because the love itself is an emotion that can't be placed into words. Mm -hmm. But the natural love, of course, is different because all of us have it to various degrees. And all of us have the capacity to experience it and all of us have the capacity to make it grow within us. Well, not really. I think. Not yet. We're dying to use the board. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the way I define the natural love is a deep, passionate desire inside of yourself for something or someone else. It's a longing that comes from your heart and is it, it's an emotion that usually is accompanied by action, immediate action. So is that clear enough as to what? So deep, passionate desire or longing that comes from your heart as an emotion towards something or someone else. Um, now obviously it has many aspects because it can be for something else or someone else and for something else or someone else in a variety of different ways. So. If we start talking about the attributes of love, now we would have to list like hundreds and hundreds of different attributes that love actually has. And this is why like, you could say love is kind, love is compassionate, love is understanding, love is considerate, love is joy, 
and you can start defining the attributes that love has using that method. But in the end, love is the emotion, soulful, strong, desirous passion that comes from you for something or someone else. And the attributes of the love, can there are literally thousands of attributes of love. When I say attributes, it's a bit like giving you... Let's say I hold up a piece of vegetation, like a tree, to you, and say, define that, or show, tell me the qualities of that. Or even if I hold up this chair and say, what's the qualities of this chair? Well, there is a quality of every chair, and that is that every chair that we're sitting on in here has four legs. Right? But not every chair has four legs, do they? Some have one leg with stands coming out from it. Some have all sorts of things. So, so that doesn't necessarily define the chair. And it's the same <coughs> with love itself. There are so many attributes of love that uh, we can also define. And that's why, like many people have written many words about love itself and what kind of qualities love displays. And love is often the sum total of all of those qualities being displayed. But if we get back to its core, love is the passionate <coughs> desire or longing for something or someone else. And, um, and obviously there's a lot involved in that. So that's how I would define the natural love. <coughs> With regard to divine, divine, divine love, defining divine love is very, very difficult. Um, because divine love, uh, like, like natural love in a way, it is an emotion. So we can say it's God's emotion of, passion, of passionate desire and longing for you. You could say that that's the divine love. But the divine love has so many more attributes than natural love that it's impossible to actually explain them intellectually without experiencing them emotionally. And that's why the importance of prayer is so uh, prayer is so important. Without prayer, which is the passionate longing, and prayer really in, a, in, in, in this aspect, is in fact your love for God. Prayer is a passionate and desirous longing for God to love you. And if we could call that prayer. And once you, once you define prayer and you start receiving God's love into your soul, then you start feeling a lot of different feelings that you've never ever experienced before and can never define. And I know that's a, a difficult thing because for most people who are intellectually trying to say, well, what's the divine love then? You know, we're not getting an answer that satisfies us. But the truth is the divine love can only satisfy you at the soul level, at the emotional level. And in fact, it's the only thing in the end that's going to satisfy you completely at the soul level. So does that help any? Um, yeah, uh, well, it's really the same thing as I heard 50 odd years ago, really. Exactly. But what I think, what I'm saying is let's revise it now, because the word through commercialism and what we hear on the crappy stuff we hear in the news and these horrible papers, we have lost that meaning. Yes. And you've revised it. And that's what I wanted these people, as well as myself, to hear. Yeah, yeah. And I think we must keep that in mind always, because we, we're doing so many other things. It's been the oldest thing in, in, our, in our lifetime. Yeah. And it's the one that's being really abused, used and abused. And it's the thing all of us want the most. It is. Uh, it as well. Just recently we had a weekend where we talked about lessons in natural love, which is lessons in the love that we have within ourselves. And we actually, all I did during that, that it took a whole weekend, 10 hours of talking, and we discussed 10 attributes mm. of natural love in that time. Mm. So 10 qualities, if you like, of natural love that help define what love, natural love is. Mm. Later in the year I'll be having a, a, a weekend similar, which will talk about a similar number of qualities of divine love, of God's love. And hopefully that will help people start understanding love. But, but the problem is nowadays, love is so distorted, like you say, mm. that um, many of us believe something to be loving, mm. when in fact it's not mm. loving at all. Mm. So often we do things for other people saying, oh, it's because I love them. Mm. But in reality, the emotion I'm feeling is guilt. 
<laughs> that's why I'm doing it. And so that's not love. Yeah, it's guilt. And, uh, and often we attribute quality, you know, like sexual desire is often attributed as love. There's another, there's another uh, uh, denomination, I think, called, they call it, is it arcade love or arcade love? It's sexual love. They have three types of love. Divine love, uh, natural love, and I think the other one is arcane, arcane love or arcade love. Right. I well, you see, I, I would say the natural love incorporates sexual love. Uh, because that is a passionate desire <coughs> moment for someone specifically in a certain way. Mm. Uh, and the natural love certainly does incorporate sexual love. In fact, the Greeks divided love into four different uh, attributes, and it can be divided far more than that, obviously, but they have four different words for it. Mm. One of the words was eros, which was erotic love. Mm. Another of the words was philia, yeah. which was like brotherly affection. Another of the words was agape, which you may have That's heard. it. That's the one. Agape love. Agape love is love based on principles. So in other words, I love you because you know, you're a person and I'm a person and you have just as much rights as I have and all of those kind of things. So, so that's a, a principled love. And then there's storge, which is a, lo a familial love, a family love. A love for family members, which is on earth different than it is in the spirit world, because in the spirit world, in fact, that type of so-called love doesn't exist. So the Greeks divided all these forms of words to define love differently, is to define the relationship that you have. So if, if you're talking about loving your brother, you would say, you know, you'd have a, f a filial affection for your brother, um, which, is a, which is the love that you would have for your brother. That would be the word philia that they would use to define that. But in the spirit world, um, Love is, uh, in the highest places of the spirit world, love is only, there are the two forms of love defined quite clearly. The love that comes from within yourself and the love that comes from God into you. And those two loves are very, very different in their experience and also in the growth of as well. Um, all of us are totally capable of growing to the sixth sphere of the spirit world without God, just by developing the natural love that's within us, which is that deep, passionate desire that we have for things within us. And if we develop that, and we develop that harmonious with truth, we will actually finish up in the sixth sphere of the spirit world, even if we don't connect with God. But you can never get to a point of abundant with God, or a point of union, of soul union with your soul mate, without receiving the divine love. The divine love has other things that are a part of it, and that it has the ability to transform the soul into a new creature. So, as you develop your natural love, you can only grow to the sixth sphere of the spirit world. And the soul itself is never changed from that of being a human soul. But as you start receiving divine love, the divine love modifies, due to a substance <coughs> in it, modifies the soul's nature into a new being. And, uh, and it actually expands the soul infinitely. Um, and, so, and so beyond the sixth sphere, if you receive divine love, you'll get to a point firstly where your soul's expanded enough to recognize its own immortality. And then uh, above the 22nd sphere, the soul has reunion with its soul mate and become one soul again. And that soul has expanded enough to be at union with itself and with God. And the soul in that condition has huge capacity to do far more things than what could be described here on earth with any of the words that we have, including creating entire universes. And so that's the state that all of us can be in at some point in, in the future. And that's the state that uh, myself and Mary have experienced for a short period of time. And the, the key the key is to um, allow yourself to understand that all of this is dependent upon receiving divine love into the soul, because it's the divine love entering the soul that transforms the soul in that regard. Um, so that uh, gives you a bit of a picture of what the divine love does. The divine love is unique, um, and of course you would expect that, being God's love. It's a unique thing that... Uh, but there are many spirits in the spirit world who believe they have received divine love and they've only ever perfected their natural love. So in other words, the perfection of natural love 
the bliss that you get from just the perfection of your natural love can be quite powerful. But many of those spirits have never received divine love. The spirits who have received divine love, often the natural love spirits look at and say they're frivolous and they, and they actually, I, I talked to a group of uh, natural love spirits in the sixth year who said that they were actually created differently to the divine love spirits because they could see the transformation of the soul and the effect that it has on the spirit form. So when you receive divine love, you no longer have seven chakras in your spirit body. You have additional chakras in your spirit body which begin to develop and some of the chakras also begin to merge. And so um, a, a, a spirit looking at a person developed in divine love will see a totally different spirit form than a person who's developed in natural love in terms of the way the energy uh, operates from coming from their body. So there's quite a number of six fear spirits here today who are investigating more things to do with the soul and my suggestion is for them to begin to listen to the divine love spirits more um, and to see that the divine love spirit actually does have a different uh, a chakra design, if you like, than the natural love spirit. And the reason why is not because they were made differently, but rather because the divine love entering the soul transforms the soul itself into a different creature. Thank you. No As you...